breaking the wall of quantum weirdness. How experiments reveal photon schizophrenia. Alain Aspect, Institut d'Optique, Palaiso. On November 9th, I was amazed that everything happened in a pacifistic way. Well, I'm glad to be here, but I must say it's a very difficult task to come after such a speech, so I'm not sure I should thank the organizers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk about quantum physics, the weirdness of quantum physics, and uh, my only excuse is that we have already one example of quantum physics really changing the society. You all know that the conceptual revolution which happened at the beginning of 20th century ultimately led to invention of transistor, laser, optical fibers, that is to say, the information society. So this thinking about quantum weirdness and thinking about these quantum mysteries eventually can be useful for the society, so it will be my excuse for this curiosity-driven research. We are going to present wave-particle duality about light. And uh, probably you know a little bit of the fact that there were many different models of light across the age. I don't go to, all, to ancient Egypt, but we know of the big conflict between Huygens, who thought that light was made of waves, and Newton, who was defending a model of particles. And the issue between the model came in the 19th century with Jung, Fresnel, and Maxwell. And at the end of the 19th century, physics was so-called completed by Lord Kelvin, and we knew that light is a wave. All phenomena like interference, diffraction, couldn't be interpreted uh, by thinking that light is a wave. And then a young guy, you may have heard of him, came and said, no, light is made of quanta, Licht quanten, he said, which are elementary grains of energy. And he made quantitative prediction for the photoelectric effect. And nobody liked his idea. And when he was selected in 1911 in the Prussian Academy of Science, they said that he has done so many good things that we are going to forgive him for his stupid representation of light and his stupid law of photoelectric effect. And the great physicist Millikan endeavored to demonstrate that he was wrong. And he showed that he was right, and eventually he received the Nobel Prize for this model of light being particle. Good. But it's not because he received the Nobel Prize for light being a particle that we have to forget about light showing phenomena like interference, diffraction, that we can understand only by assuming that it is a wave. So how can we reconcile the two ideas? Is it a particle or a wave? Well, Einstein himself was obsessed by the problem. And as early as 1909, in a famous conference in Salzburg, he came with the conclusion that you don't have to choose. It's both a wave and a particle. And one decade later, or even more, Louis de Broglie came with the opposite idea that something you think is a particle is also a wave. And of course, all this is easy to say in words but very difficult to understand with images. So how do we represent wave-particle duality in textbooks? We suppose we can emit individual particles, individual photons, and they, we have two holes. And if we have a detector scanning the pattern here, we see bright fringes and dark fringes, bright fringes and dark fringes, and we come to the conclusion that this is due to the fact that we have to describe light as made of wave. The wave passes simultaneously the through holes, and the result here depends on the difference between the two paths. OK, so this is a wave description of light, which allows us to understand interference. Have we 
observe interference with single particle, because you understand, obviously, that the problem comes when I have a single particle. And surprisingly, although the question was raised at the beginning of the 19th century, the answer came only in 1985, when my PhD student, Philippe Grangier, and I, we did we built the first source of single photons, and we could demonstrate that indeed single photon shows this wave-like behavior, which implies that in a sense a photon is going through the two holes simultaneously. How could we prove that we are really built a source for single photons? If it was a source for ordinary waves, this is what would happen the wave will go simultaneously through the two holes, and if I have a detector here and a detector there, I have a reasonable probability to have a joint detection here and there. On the other hand, if I have a single particle, if it is a single photon, going, it will go either up or down, and the two detectors will never fire simultaneously. We build our source, we run the experiment, and we show that indeed we don't have joint detection here, so we have proven that we have a single, a single photon source. Can, could we observe interference with single photons? And the answer is yes. And you see it was a very complicated source, and here you have interference pattern, but I would rather present the way such an experiment is done in a modern way. In a modern way, now the big room full of lasers is replaced by the single molecule excited with a laser indeed and emitting single photon. And this, this single photon enters an interferometer which is called the Fresnel double prism interferometer. And the idea is the following. If you have a wave, the, a part of the wave will be deflected down here and a part of the wave will be deflected up here. So what do I expect? If I have a single photon, the single photon, or if I have a particle, I should say, the particle will go either up or down, and I will never observe any coincidence here. And we did the experiment, and it works. And then, now we put a CCD camera here at the overlap between the two beams. And if this photon shows interference, we are going to observe interference here, and I cannot resist showing it. So, here, what we have is the CCD here, and we are going to see each photon arriving as a bright, as a red spot. So let's play it, and you see photon arrive, red spots here, and here, we sum everything happening on a vertical line, and you see progressively what you... I can accelerate it, because otherwise a gentleman will come and chase me out. <laughs> so, a little later, even later, and you see what happens. Photons come one after the other one, but they accumulate on bright light, and they almost never come here on that line, and so, this is really interference with single photons. Why do I say it is really with single photons? Well, let us come back here. So we have observed wave-like behavior in the single photon regime. And is this really weird? Because look, we did the first experiment, and the first experiment told us it is detected either here or there, which means that it has traveled either up and down or down and goes here. But in the second experiment, the fact that we observe interference here shows there is no doubt that something passed simultaneously up and down. But look, it's the same source, the same apparatus here, the same apparatus here, same apparatus up to here. How can it be that the same system in the first experiment tells us something goes either up or down, and in the second experiment something goes on both paths simultaneously? Well, this contradictory image is the weirdness of wave-particle duality. And of course, when you have a problem in understanding quantum mechanics, 
You go to Mr. Bohr and you say, what would Niels Bohr have said about that? And Niels Bohr would have said, look, let us be serious. You have to choose, either do the experiment or do that one. You cannot do both simultaneously. So if you ask the question, are you a particle? It answers, yes, I am a particle. And if you ask the question, are you a wave? It answers, yes, it is a wave. And you say, oh, I understand. When the photon arrives here, it looks and says, aha, this is an interferometer. I'm going to pretend I am a wave. <laughs> and then Mr. Wheeler, which was very smart, say, OK, if you really believe such a thing, what would happen if you would not choose between this and that until the photon arrives here? Right? So the idea is that the two experiments are incompatible. We must choose the equation, but we can make the choice long after the photon enters the apparatus. Basically, you can make the choice until the moment when it arrives here. You can make the choice either to introduce a CCD camera or to remove it and to let it proceed to the detectors. The experiment, the so-called Wheeler's Delay Choice Experiment, has been done recently by a team at École Normale Supérieure de Cachan. It's a long interferometer, 50 meters long, so that there is plenty of time. The photon enters, travels, 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 and only at the very last moment, you decide either to recombine the two beams to observe interference, or not to recombine them and let them go to the two detectors. And the result is that, as usual, quantum mechanics wins. When we consider the results where we look for interference, we see, for, we see interference. When we look for a particle-like behavior, we see a particle-like behavior. But again, the decision to put the camera or not to put a camera was taken long after the photon enters the interferometer. <laughs> so, what can we conclude? Well, I'd like to appreciate this complicated sentence of John Wheeler. The only reasonable conclusion is that one decides the photon has come by one route or by both routes after it has already done its travel. What can we conclude? Wave particle duality is one of the great mysteries of quantum mechanics. An experimental fact forced us to accept this. The daily choice experiment teaches us that Bohr complementarity is not such a naive thing as people often presented in elementary book of quantum mechanics. Bohr complementarity, there is some truth in it, but it's much more subtle than we think. But then, I would like to come back to the point that trying to understand better quantum mechanics can, de can lead us somewhere. And questioning the foundation of quantum mechanics, which happened in the last decade, brought and que questioning the two great mysteries of quantum mechanics, which are still there, one about entanglement, I did not quote it, and this one about single photon, led us to what is called quantum information. Quantum information is on one hand quantum computer, that does not yet work, but it's also quantum cryptography, which already works. And this is an example of a scheme which is based on single photon behavior. The scheme is due to Gilles Brassard and Charles Benner, and it's a story about two lovers, Alice and Bob, who want to exchange secret message. It's more fun than bankers, okay? Uh, lovers who want to exchange secret message with the awful eavesdropper not being able to intercept the message. And the idea of quantum cryptography is that the secrecy of the message does not rely on a certain level of technology, on the fact that the computers are not fast enough. It relies on the fundamental properties of quantum mechanics, the fact that when you have a single photon, if you try to observe it on a single photon, you necessarily slightly change it. And this, I am going to conclude, and just to tell you that breaking the world of the wall of weird concept may eventually lead to applications. And to finish, I want to show the people who have done the experiment. It's a family 
question because, you know, this was my first PhD student. He was the first PhD student of this one, and he was the first PhD student of that one. So you have many generations, so it's quantum mechanics in the family. Thank you very much.